Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Siobhan Moore. I'm coming to you from Addis Ababa and the Ilri campus here. I hope everyone is keeping well despite uh, the surge of infections that we're seeing in the region. Um, as you know, we meet monthly to talk about uh, One Health and, and in particular the um, applied or the application of, of One Health uh, in the field and, and especially in pastoralist settings and other settings. And for the last a uh, few sessions we've been talking about um, WASH and WASH related um, aspects of One Health. And so today it brings me great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Chris Pinto, who is coming to us from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And today she's going to be presenting uh, on some of the work that they've been doing as a, a systematic a mammoth a systematic review of, of WASH and uh, related interventions, particularly with reference to uh, agricultural systems. So Chris is a veterinarian by uh, original training. She's uh, from Peru and she has um, spent much of her career up till now focusing on sort of more the, the molecular microbiology aspects of, of infection and, and pathogen transmission and antimicrobial resistance in particular. Um, but in recent years, she's been crossing over into public health and is now uh, doing a range of projects that look at uh, infection control, including in human health settings. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Chris now. And Chris, if you'd like to share your screen. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm going to turn on my camera to quickly say hello to everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm just going to turn it off just to be sure there are no connectivity issues. Let's start sharing my screen. Yep, can you see it? Yep, it's perfect. Take it away. Perfect. Right. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Silvan, and thanks to all those attending this presentation today. Um, we, I would like to share uh, with you the results of our systematic review uh, about wash and biosecurity interventions to reduce part of infections and antimicrobial resistance in animal agricultural settings. This was uh, teamwork, so I would like to acknowledge here Sarai, Pranav, and Claire for their hard work uh, in this review. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah. So I start, we all know that uh, AMR is a global concern and one of the main areas of research in the world in general. However, the amount of evidence that is available for antimicrobial stewardship and awareness in the general population and healthcare professionals is much bigger than the evidence available for antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial use in animals, much less is available in the environment. Evidence of interventions is more scarce, although the information available is mainly focused on reducing transmission of AMR or reducing AMU. Less is known about how reducing burden of infections in general could also contribute to reduce uh, AMR and the need to use antibiotics. So, Working uh, towards the, uh, reducing burden of infections and diseases in general, the World Bank defined AMR interventions in uh, AMR interventions in two, in two categories: AMR sensitive, sensitive interventions uh, for those that contribute indirectly to combat uh, to combating AMR, and AMR specific interventions to those that uh, have a, a direct impact. Or the main purpose is to reduce antimicrobial resistance. So this highlighted the importance of AMR sensitive interventions. Uh, there is a great potential for co-benefits with other health problems. Basically, within AMR sensitive interventions, we have, for example, WASH that reduces viral infections and therefore could have an impact in reducing antimicrobial resistance. In animal agricultural settings, the evidence interventions addressing the contribution of animal production systems to the burden of infections and the microbial resistance is even less available. It's known that, for example, free poultry scavenging could contribute to diarrhea in children or that 
in intensive farming systems, animal food, uh, there is a flow of uh, um, microbes from animals to humans through the food chain. Farmers and household members of farming communities are commonly exposed to pathogens coming from animals. All these, all these are common sources of bacterial infections and therefore increase exposure to antimicrobial resistance bacteria or facilitate the interchange of uh, resistant genes between different bacterial species. All this is even more important in low and middle income countries where the abundance of antimicrobial resistance is predicted to be very high. In this research from 2019, a researcher found a strong association between AMR gene abundance and socioeconomic health and environmental uh, factors. Uh, when we talk about the distribution of resistance coming from animals in these countries, a study also from 2019 suggested emerging hotspots of resistance, like the red circles that are here. Uh, <clears throat> in economies where there was a shift from, hold, from smallholders to intensive farmers. In many low and middle income countries, antibiotics are still part of production systems, especially in intensive farming. We know that, for example, the widespread of antimicrobials in animal agriculture and aquaculture could contribute to the presence of antimicrobial residues, metabolites, presence of resistant bacteria and resistant genes in animal waste. In this sense, antibiotics have been described uh, by one of, of my colleagues as a quick fix to compensate for deficiencies in health systems, including care and hygiene, and in the animal health field uh, to ensure productivity and uh, support and uh, to support farming in general. In animal production, biosecurity is one of the main ways to prevent and control infections in animals and to avoid the dissemination of microbes to humans. In this sense, biosecurity, well, the OIE defined biosecurity as a set of management and physical measures designed to reduce the risk of introduction, establishment, and spread of animal diseases or infections from and within an animal population. This can be grouped in three categories, um, bioexclusion, biocontainment, and biomanagement. And these are related to, to the, to if the, the strategy is aim, 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 aims to prevent the, the infection and introduction of new pathogens or control pathogens that have already entered farms. When we talk about WASH, uh, we talk about the, the intervention to improve access to these services. No? WASH is mainly used in human populations, and this can be grouped in into four categories, water quality, uh, and water quantity, sanitation, and hygiene. And all of those are uh, about more than providing, providing services. In human health, there are more than uh, four. We, we did a quick, quick review of WASH in human health. And we noticed that, for example, from 40, uh, 40 systematic reviews about the importance of uh, WASH in human health, we found that the majority of them focus on reducing child diarrhea, child diarrhea, trachoma, elmintiasis, and other health problems. Just one study aimed to highlight the importance of the animal component when applying WASH interventions. And in the last years, researchers have highlighted the importance of WASH to the AMR program and how crucial it is to include the animal component when implementing uh, WASH interventions. I think you, you had a two weeks ago some, uh, a talk about putting the A into WASH that, that was uh, a call for introducing uh, the animal component into, into WASH, and I think that was very, very interesting. Uh, in animal agriculture, the WASH concept hasn't been conceptual, conceptualized yet. But we consider that the animal component in WASH, uh, we, I think we should think not just about feces, but animal fluids in general. Especially when we apply these strategies, 
uh, to people working with animals uh, in, in different uh, animal production systems, like the smallholders or farming communities or subsistence farmers, and even intensive farmers, Inter intensive farming. It's also important to look at the importance of wash under the One Health umbrella. For human health, for example, when we look at zoonosis and food safety, for animal health, when we think of international trade and how that affects animal productivity and has an economic impact in farmers, and to reduce environmental contamination when using manure or to fertilize crops, for example, or uh, how this can uh, contribute to spread AMR bacteria to rivers, soil, or even wildlife. Both wash and biosecurity interventions can contribute to reduce flooding of infections. And when we think about those two fields, we see that there are many overlaps. For instance, both are about reducing risks, prevent and control diseases, improve people's economy, or improve infra infrastructure. They both uh, have a slightly different strategies, but both in, in focus on in improving cleaning and disinfection and waste management as main goals. Because of the many overlaps between wash and biosecurity, we provide here an example of interventions included in biosecurity that can be also considered in WASH. Uh, for example, we see here that uh, for animals, it's also important to provide clean water and uh, to um, provide hand washing facilities to farm workers or uh, people en uh, entering farms. Similarly, in as in hygiene, in biosecurity, we focus on cleaning and disinfection, and like in, when we implement food baths, and in sanitation, when we are thinking about um, removal of manure or control, control of fallen stock, like how we dispose bodies of animals that, are, that have died in, in the farm. In the sanitation area, for example, for wash, we also think that is about providing latrines or uh, to, to communities. But we also we know that, for example, within sanitation, there is a, one of the categories called ecological sanitation. That is, it's about avoiding the contamination of the environment through the use of man, manure. So we propose here a, a framework to conceptualize wash and biosecurity interve interventions with the potential to reduce water infections and therefore antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance. Um, we, propose, sorry, we propose different pathways to showcase how inadequate wash and biosecurity contributes to increase the risk of infections in humans, animals, and to disseminate uh, these uh, pathogens and resistant genes to the environment. Regardless of the importance of WASH to the AMR agenda, there is lack of information about the importance of WASH in animal agriculture. We can see here that uh, when we think about the services being provided, uh, sorry, there are noise. There is noise in the background. If someone can turn off their mics, it would be great. Um, when we think about uh, wash, inadequate wash and um, lack of biosecurity measures, we think about different pathways uh, to show how this can incre increase burden of infections and therefore the necessity to increase the, increase the use of antibiotics, which can uh, lead to antimicrobial resistance. <clears throat> So in this, so the rationale for performing this research uh, was based on the lack of information about the importance of wash in animal agriculture. Um, that wash are non, uh, strategies are not necessarily adopting one health approaches. Uh, many interventions focusing on AMR, um, but not many assess the impact of the interventions uh, of the intervention in short and long term. So we wanted to know more about the sustainability of these interventions. Um, there is not much evidence about the impact of these interventions and how and why they work. Um, well, in, and in this review, we also wanted to look at publications that, are not, that were not just published 
in English, but in other languages. So we wanted to have a, um, a wider range of studies to include. Uh, the research questions that we wanted to answer were these two. What type of wildlife biosecurity interventions that play a role in reducing burden of infections and have the potential to reduce AMR and AMU in animals and humans are uh, implemented in agricultural settings and, and under which enabling and limiting conditions these interventions are effective for reducing this uh, AMR and burden of infections. We develop uh, our PICOS strategy follow the PRISMA statement. Um, as we know that the complexity of WASH uh, interventions makes difficult to perform randomized control trials. Uh, we included different uh, study designs uh, in, into the review. We also included studies in these four languages, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. And our protocol was uh, published in the PROSPER database. To have access to a wide range of literature, we perform a search in different, uh, in these different databases. Uh, we also look for great literature and the references of, select, of selected articles, and we develop the search strategy in four languages. To apply the concept of WASH in animal, animal agricultural settings, we adopted these definitions in, to animal agriculture. So for example, for water quantity, we, were, we included interventions that focus on, for example, insta installing water facilities like pumps and deposits or tanks in farms, harvesting uh, rainwater systems and for water quality, for example, how we can in improve the quality of the water with different techniques like filtration, sedimentation, chlorination, or apply, uh, application of radiation. For sanitation, how uh, these strategies are good to improve composting methods or treatment of manure, or in installing uh, septic tanks or treating slurry from animals. And in hygiene, we included the uh, disinfection of equipment or the, the use of uh, bedding, food baths, sanitizers, and other uh, strategies that are able to reduce the amount of bacteria in surfaces in animal facilities. The outcomes of interest were all related to the reduction of number of infections and diseases, the reduction of microbial loads in the environment. These are the interventions that we thought were will have an indirect effect in, in WASH, sorry, in AMR, because they are not necessarily focusing on reducing antimicrobial resistance or reducing antimicrobial use, but reducing uh, the number of pathogens that are available at, that are in, in the environment or that are infecting uh, people. Uh, and for the direct uh, outcomes of interest, we included also the reduction of antimicrobial use and reduction of antimicrobial resistance uh, that, and those were the studies that had an direct effect in AMR. As part of our eligibility criteria, we included interventions that included not just bacteria, but other microorganisms that can be treated with antibiotics, as some viruses and unicellular parasites, for example, can are treated with antibiotics. I remember when doing a, um, a research in awareness of antimicrobial resistance, one of the questions was about how uh, metronidazole, for example, can be used to treat some parasitic infections. And if that, if we are just focusing on bacteria, sometimes we can miss that as a, and it's an important part of, of, or could be an important part of the problem. We excluded interventions applied outside farms or production sites. We also excluded articles testing interventions in vitro or at laboratories or that were limited to human health facilities. We extracted data from all these topics from, from each article and the abstract screening and full text assessment were conducted by two reviewers individually. 
as we were especially interested on structural interventions, and we wanted to introduce here this topic because uh, structural interventions are interventions that focus on changing the political and economic context where health is produced or reproduced. These interventions are important because they don't put the burden of the solution on individuals, but in systems. And we think it's important that when we are promoting uh, interventions to reduce antimicrobial resistance, we think about how not just the, 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 the farmer has to solve their own problems, but how the community, the society, the government can support these farmers in, the, in these tasks. So we have uh, four categories, structural interventions, and then biological and chemical interventions that uh, were uh, a category that included strategies such as competitive exclusion or applying uh, products to eliminate pathogens, uh, that interventions that focus in improving infrastructure in farms or changing the physical environment, and interventions that were uh, Focusing, that focus on education or educational activities or behavioral strategies to change uh, people's practices. That we call them non-structural interventions. So <laughs> we found from uh, 20,672 articles identified through primary searches, we identify uh, as their Following a rigorous process, we identify 104 articles to include in this review. From 104 articles included, 19 included human populations, uh, including farm workers and household members, and 102 animal populations, uh, included animal populations, including livestock, poultry, and aquaculture. The most common animal species studied in this uh, articles were poultry and pigs. Um, the environmental factor included in these studies were was commonly associated with manure treating of manure or uh, improving or, or cleaning surfaces of animal facilities. Most studies were published in English, and the duration of the interventions varied uh, range uh, was had a media of one year. However, interventions, some interventions were followed up by like follow up three days or even 10 years. There was a trend on the number of studies available per year, which indicates that there is a growing interest in infections through the years. And regarding the microorganism involved, many studies focus on more than one bacterial species. But when focusing in just one species, they commonly uh, were about Salmonella or uh, Campylobacter that are common zoonotic pathogens. The majority of the studies were non-randomized studies as we expected because of the complexity of these interventions. Although we found that a quarter of them were randomized controlled trials. Uh, the funding sources of these studies Came from, from, um, mainly come, came from national funding bodies. I think this is important because I think this shows that in most places, uh, the, the, the funding or the collaboration of international organizations uh, or international funding bodies uh, not necessarily focus on this type of, this type of strategies. Regarding the types of interventions covered, uh, just one article included an intervention that could be categorized as structural interventions. And within the non-structural ones, uh, 15 were educational and behavioral, 26 involved modification of infrastructure or apparatus, and 57 focused in the application of biological or chemical products to eliminate pathogens. Uh, that this result is especially important as it indicates that most current available interventions are still putting the burden of the solution on individuals instead of systems. Studies uh, 
were performed in 40 different countries all around the world. However, the majority of these studies were from high income country settings, especially Europe and Asia. Many of the interventions took place in intensive farming contexts and in experimental settings, but uh, and just a few were uh, performed in smallholders or subsistence farmers. Overall, beyond information, uh, the information about livelihood systems, there wasn't many uh, authors didn't really report this information about, for example, the physical or ecological or cultural context where the studies were conducted. So the assessment of the context part that we were uh, interested to, to analyze uh, wasn't easy to, um, to, do, to, uh, to find. When classifying these studies according to their relevance to Russian biosecurity, we found, for example, that, uh, that most studies uh, focus on hygiene or cleanliness of uh, farms or farm environments. And from this, most were implemented, implemented in the biomanagement category of biosecurity, which means that most studies were trying to uh, establish strategies to control pathogens rather than preventing them. I think uh, this shows a little bit how we 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 are working right now in in, in general, where we are more focused focus more in in controlling things that are already there than in preventing infections or the entrance to of pathogens to farm environments. In re interventions related to water quantity focus on strategies to adjust the quantity of water provided to animals, whereas water quality included the strategies to prevent microbial contamination of water by applying acids to say to, to change the pH of the water, for example, or interventions in ensuring cleaning, uh, cleaner drinking systems or improving the quality of water using aquaculture through changes in water temperature or using UV radiation. Interventions in a sanitation category were associated with manure or the treatment of manure. Here we included the only intervention that was a policy that was considered a structural intervention. It was a, a policy to control uh, the use of manure, of livestock manure in uh, rice fields. Um, and this policy tried to um, reduce or to prevent the emergence of leptospirosis. Interventions in the hygiene category were associated with cleaning and disinfection of surfaces, farm equipment, changing practices in farm workers through disinfection protocols, or implementing a code of practice for workers to reduce exposure to pathogens. Interventions oriented to prevent the entrance of pathogens or uh, to production systems included use of competitive exclusion techniques, educational interventions to raise um, backyard poultry and confinement of free ranging animals when animals uh, especially for when animals were raised for, for subsistence. And one of the, the interesting studies that we found here was a Peruvian study, <laughs> uh, coincidentally, that uh, tried to corral chickens in shanty towns to reduce the, the, the number of cases of carpylobacteriosis in children. And it was very interesting because then they published a series of articles showing that uh, in some cases, uh, this uh, strategy increased the number of infections instead of reduce the number of infections. And it, it, like they, they, they suggested that maybe the continuous exposure of the children to these chickens uh, gave them some kind of immunity to fight infections or to, to fight Campylobacter infections. Whereas if they weren't exposed to this infections uh, to these uh, chickens, 
they didn't have any immunity. So the, the disease or the infection for Campylobacteriosis, for Campylobacter from other sources was even more, uh, it, it was even worse for them. So it, I think it was very, very interesting. Bioencotainment interventions were mostly related to avoid the dissemination of antimicrobial resistant genes present in manure, manure or disposal of fallen stock in farms. And these biocontainment uh, interventions were important because when we look at the effect of the interventions, we saw that, majority, that the majority of these uh, interventions related to the treatment of manure or reducing or mitigating the risk of uh, the dissemination of antimicrobial resistant genes had a positive effect. Finally, uh, biomanagement strategies were varied and included strategies such as adjusting flooring, where animals are raised, improve air quality in farm environments, educational interventions to improve practices in animals or, uh, with mastitis, litter treatment strategies, uh, restriction of animal movement, and use of protective equipment by farm workers. In general, the biomanagement and biocontainment measures appear to have positive effects um, most often. These measure, measures attempted to creating and maintaining a condu conducive environment for animal raising in terms of uh, physical infrastructure and protocols. The few studies reporting sanitation measures uh, which were similar to the, the interventions about biocontainment, also reported uh, positive effects. By contrast, efforts to improve, uh, to impact water quantity, water quality, and hygiene in general had more mixed effects. Um, from when we look at the how these uh, interventions, what were the outcomes of these interventions and how we how they impact these different areas that we were trying to um, analyze. We saw that uh, 87 studies assess impact of infection infection levels in general. Three only three on antibiotic use and 14 on antibiotic resistance. Of these 104 studies, 64 show uh, positive impacts on infection burden. The three studies in antimicrobial use had a positive effects, and just seven of these uh, 14 studies on antimicrobial resistance had a positive effect. Most interventions reported outcomes relevant to infection prevention and control, such as reduction of bacterial counts, reduction of bacterial concentration, reduction of positive microbiological culture, reduction of bacteria isolated from animal facilities, reduction of morbidity or mortality rates, reduction of incidence prevalence of infections, diseases, either in animals or humans. Uh, whereas uh, studies that reported outcomes relevant to, relevant to the control of antimicrobial resistance or bacteria, presence of bacteria or antimicrobial resistant genes um, were um, less, Sorry, were less um, common. Overall, just over half of the studies were uh, assessed to be a high risk of bias, while fewer were assessed to be at low, and 20% around uh, around 20% had a moderate risk of bias. When comparing the reported effects of the interventions, the overall risk of bias and the interventions classified what, what they were impacting, we found that the interventions oriented to reduce antimicrobial use uh, reported a positive effect. And these ones had either moderate or high risk of bias. Conversely, there were various infection prevention and control interventions aiming to reduce burden of infections that reported a positive effect and were assessed as low risk of bias. Interventions implemented to decrease and control the dissemination of antimicrobial resistant genes uh, di directly impact impacting AMR had mostly positive results. When 
looking at the barriers you identify in this, in this, or with, which were the enabling or limiting conditions of these interventions, we found that, for example, no many interventions or almost no really uh, try to provide an estimation of costs of the intervention. Um, they they didn't perform uh, cost analysis or cost effectiveness analysis. This makes difficult the task of implementing these interventions as policies, as the intervention can be very successful, but if we don't know how much is, this is going to cost, uh, this is uh, it's very hard to translate this to the the reality in a, to a policy. We also found that no studies included a system to provide economic incentives to farmers to improve their practices. Uh, in many studies, the lack of diagnosis had an impact level had an impact in the levels of productivity of these um, um, of of, of these uh, production systems. We had a secondary outcomes on uh, production um, outcomes, but we we didn't report them because we were focusing on here because we were focusing on the ones that directly impact antimicrobial resistance or that in, could indirectly impact antimicrobial resistance. Regarding feasibility of interventions, some interventions may be hard to follow for social or cultural reasons. Uh, and also many communities, uh, farmer, farming communities are unaware of pathogens. So they may have doubts about the necessity of these interventions. Uh, researchers, uh, I think for many researchers, time constraints and funding rules prevent them, prevent them to follow up their interventions for longer periods, and this affects the assessment of the sustainability of these interventions. This, uh, regarding the, the characteristics of the studies included, we, we noticed that many of them had insufficient sample size, so uh, Deciding if these interventions were really effective or not was was difficult, or that they uh, had a short duration. Most interventions focus on intensive farming. We were looking for, especially, especially for the ones that were about small holders or subsistence farmings, but we didn't find many available, and very few. Well, just one really uh, had. Uh, was classified as structural and intervention. To, we couldn't really analyze the, the context because the lack of information about this in, in these uh, articles. These, many of these studies had very complex situational realities. Uh, so the, the making these interventions or uh, applying these interventions to different contexts was difficult because we didn't have this information um, about, uh, available. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so when we think about what, what are the, the research gaps or the future directions, we, we can say that, for example, um, affording greater attention to animals when implementing wash for human communities in farming settings is important. We noticed that, for example, many many of the studies that we found that were about wash uh, were specifically focused on humans and didn't include the animal component. So it was difficult for us to include that those studies in our in our um, uh, review because they didn't include any outcome of interest so we we know that there are many many wash interventions that could be um, relevant for this field however as they were they didn't have an, they didn't analyze uh, the animal component or the effect of this in in uh, farming communities giving specific information about this in, this in in the in the article uh, was very hard to 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 include uh, make us uh, make make the task of including these articles hard in uh, hard hard to include these articles sorry in, in the review uh, we need more studies promoting structural changes in animal animal agricultural settings we will have liked to see some studies for example 
proposing some uh, safety nets or incent economic incent incentives to farmers or people producing animals to implement uh, biosecurity measures, but we didn't find many. Maybe they are, I'm pretty sure they are, but most of them must be uh, included as policies and not, uh, maybe there is not an analysis of the impact of these interventions in, 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 in research. And many, most of these studies are performed in high income countries. Um, Chris, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just to make sure we have time for discussion, can you uh, try to wrap things up soon? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just two things. Um, well, we need to emphasize hygiene, sanitation in settings surrounding animal production facilities, not just within, fa within, animal, within farms. We need to um, look at low cost approaches that promote, fin promote financial benefits and minimize personal discomfort for farmers. We wanted to say that, uh, that besides including the importance of animals in the wash, uh, in wash strategies, we also wanted to, to highlight that as biosecurity interventions also focus on improving the quality of air in farms and animal facilities. We can also include this uh, in, uh, for, in for, hum uh, for humans, especially in the current situation when we know that many airborne pathogens can be transmitted from animals to uh, people. So we propose that the A in WASH stands for both animals and air. I think that's all. Thank you. Great, thank you and sorry to, to rush you there. I know it's a really um, massive area and you've done such a comprehensive job of analyzing the evidence and presenting a summary for us. Um, I'm going to open up for questions, but just to highlight um, something that uh, there's a private message around the um, availability of these slides afterwards. So the presentation itself will be presented on the, or has been recorded and will be uploaded to the HEAL website. So you'll be able to watch it again. But Chris, um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's also a report that's, that's available um, that summarizes the findings. Is that correct? Yes, is that, that's correct. We have a, a descriptive report of our findings. We are, as I told you at the beginning, we are publishing this research this year. So we will um, uh, have the article uh, available in uh, relatively soon. But for anybody that can, uh, that wants uh, more information about this, we can send them the report or I can send you the link to the report. So you can distribute that to them. So how should uh, should people email you if they want that report or yeah yeah they could they could do that uh, alternatively they can just look for the text the title and look at LSHTN research online and mm -hmm. I've just popped it in the chat okay perfect <laughs> okay great um, ah there we go so you can see it in the the link there for people who'd like to follow up. Um, yep. So I will turn it over and I can see there's been some questions around um, the uh, Fleming Foundation. And I don't know, Brian, if you'd like to follow up with, with a, a question. Thank you very much, Siobhan. And I just, well, what a very comprehensive and uh, uh, overview of, uh, and an awful lot of work that has gone into that. Uh, I guess my, my, my question is more sort of an institutional link. I mean, it's oh, the, the, the Fleming Fund has, has invested an awful lot in different countries, low and middle income countries, in looking at the capacity to, uh, to assess antimicrobial resistance, both in uh, institutionally in countries and also in laboratory capacity. Um, I wonder how, what can be learned? I'm trying to think of, of not uh, duplicating things or how can such uh, work and London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine clearly has all sorts of partners. What is the link between the, the, the sort of institutional and, and, uh, and understanding capacity types of studies and, and this sort of these overall assessments and bringing animals into, into it as you have described so nicely. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Well, uh, we well we this research was um, done in collaboration with 
people from the CIAR. We had we presented the protocol to some ILRI researchers and we received their feedback in our protocol. We also linked, uh, well, we also were working with people from um, WHO, the World Bank, and all of them were, uh, or, and people working in WASH, uh, like Oliver Cumming. Uh, so we were trying to really receive the input of uh, many many people in our in our research we know that there is another because there are not many people working with interventions in, in animals i guess um or that or these studies are very very specific and there is a, another research team working with uh, this kind of amr interventions uh i think it's a swedish team uh that is in charge uh, I think it's Didier Warnley, and they are also working with interventions in AMR, and they have developed a database where people, where they are inviting people, inviting people that have interventions to to include their interventions in their database. So they have this big, massive information available for everyone. Um, regarding the Fleming Fund, well, the LCSTM has some Fleming Fund fellows, and we well, we try to to collaborate with them and they, they are doing all these sessions of community of practice when they are sharing their information. So, so I hope that um, type of th that kind of helps to disseminate this information that I know is important for many, many people. Thank you. If I can just invite people who uh, have a question to maybe put your hand up or just drop a comment in the box and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on something because I was surprised that there were so few studies um, on structural and, and behavioural and education type interventions, which seems to me to be a disconnect with, I think, the majority of, of total research, which is, you know, there's just so much documentation, particularly in, in low, income, low income countries around antimicrobial use and interventions around knowledge attitudes and practices and those sorts of things so is the disconnect that there's just not a lot of research that's taking that into the intervention side of things then so it's just that we're still in this stage of low level evidence generation uh, well, around this yeah i would say that there is a lot of this information the problem is mm -hmm. that they don't evaluate uh they didn't include any of our outcomes of interests so mm -hmm. that's why we couldn't include this information but mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there is plenty of information about education and high hand hygiene, especially promoting high hand hygiene. Exactly. But if they, the way that they were evaluating these interventions was mm. difficult for us to include them because mm. we, we couldn't analyze how they were good at reducing burden of infections or sonotic pathogens or uh, AMR or antimicrobial use. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so um, we've got a comment from Anders. Over to you, Anders. Yes, hi. Thanks, Chris, for, for a very nice presentation there. I think just, just on the st structural issues, I think at least from, from several places in Europe, we, we know that the whole area of legislation and policies, if they are, you know, put in place, implemented, and even actually developed in kind of a dialogue with, with in this case, uh, the livestock industry, this can be quite effective. But I think at, a lot of the challenges for the, for the research done, probably also that you've seen, Chris, is that, that um, it's very complicated to, to really do this type of research with uh, local government authorities, ministries, et cetera. And, and that's probably why it has not been done. It's much easier just to go in and do your research than, than really work closely with changing policies and, and try to measure impact of uh, such changes of policies. But there's no doubt that, that uh, this is definitely what is needed to, to make some big changes. Uh, in particular, if you talk uh, on, on the AMU side, I mean, the, the whole legislation about, um, you know, we know from essential drug list from human medicine, how, how effective uh, that can be. Uh, and, and we know from Europe, uh, how effective it is actually uh, to have legislation where you guide towards, uh, you know, less critical drugs you would like to have used in, in livestock compared to, to, uh, to the more critical ones. 
and, and that can be quite effective. But it's difficult type of research and, and it, uh, you need to really engage and involve heavily with the local policymakers. Over. Yeah. Well, thanks, Anders. I think you described the problem very well. Um, and, and yes, we were quite surprised that we didn't find many, like not in the research way or, or an evaluation of these strategies. So we, we couldn't uh, provide any evidence of how effective they were or if they have positive or negative impacts because the information wasn't there. I think there are examples though of sort of case studies, right? Like, um, or maybe sort of industry-wide studies. I'm thinking of salmonella in pork um, in Denmark, is it? But, or, or, you know, there's the sort of some specific examples where changes in regulation have then been able to confirm um, changes in, in incidence of AMR and, and even just pathogen load, full stop. Um, but the extent to which those kinds of examples can then be transferable to other settings, uh, I think is a is a big question, and then as you've as you've, your research clearly shows that there's a big gap on the low income side of things as well, um, low income country side. There's just not a lot of research being done in that case. Do we have um, uh, any other people who'd like to comment? I can see some comments in the um, chat box. I don't know, Claire, if you'd like to speak to your comment or if we have any other questions. No, I don't have any further comments on it. Um, I was just uh, getting excited, so <laughs> echoing what was being said in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. But fantastic presentation, Chris. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, could I put one more? Uh, so, I, I think I think we, for many good reasons, you know, have a have a focus in a lot of the research on what you would call small scale production, small scale livestock productions. But actually, we can see from a lot of research, uh, again, I can refer to Europe, that, that some of the productions that really can lead the way are actually the more intensive uh, productions. And we can actually see in places in Southeast Asia at the moment uh, that they are actually you know, already taking the initiatives to stop using, for example, cholestine in, in pig production because they know already in a few years this will be banned. So already for the market, for consumers, for export reasons, they're already moving in these directions. Um, and, and, and also when it comes to the whole biosecurity, Chris, like, like you described, I mean, they are in a position where they can take advantage of, of the investment because it's actually quite costly to put in these biosecurity measures. And often the small farmer will rightly, you know, ask you, well, if I have to do this, make these investments, what, what is my return of that? And to be honest, often you have to tell them we are really unsure because just the simple facts that you don't know the disease status of all the animals that you are trading, that, that sort of undermine a lot of your biosecurity you, you may would like to do. So I think one should really look more closely into the semi and intensive production and, 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 and the larger scale productions because they can actually lead the way uh, in, in, in a lot of these uh, areas and, and definitely lead the way on, on changing patterns of AMU over. Yeah. I think you have a question, Anders. <laughs> Chris, did you want to follow up? Let me just check the, uh, the chat box. Um, yeah, well, uh, I think, <laughs> as you said, I think we sometimes we are, um, I think the, the importance of the structural interventions highlights that the fact that sometimes we are asking the people to solve their own problems without providing them much support. So that's not sustainable in the long term. Uh, they may try to, to, to do something if they can see the problem. It is something that they, because sometimes they are even unaware. They are just using antibiotics and things. And they are not thinking of, of the consequences uh, or if that is that's profitable or there has a profit for them or have it has an economic benefit so definitely the lack of these uh, incentives or systems in place to support these uh, farming practices or biosecurity implementation of biosecurity it is is not uh, very very available so definitely that's that's a problem mm -hmm. And a question uh, or a comment uh, raised by Claire, <laughs> just around the, the usual issue of, of intellectual property and, and the degree to which industries are willing to share data. 
Oh, yeah, because basically we're much. still, you know, we've done this whole review and then we found, you know, one structural, in the, you know, and it, um, we really wanted to learn, okay, so what can we try? What can we try in different places? And really it's a little bit disappointing having, you know, good, done all of this work and then found that, oh, there's not really very much that's been published that can tell us what, what would work, you know, at a slightly more distal level. Um, and, um, and some of the reasons that it seems that some of those things don't work is, yeah, things like, it, how, where else can we learn from? If we can't learn from a systematic review, where else can we learn from things that could be tried that aren't just starting again? Because what we see so often is just starting from scratch again and again, and people just trying to educate people or, you know, it, it's, you know, we really need to be collectively learning. And systematic review is one of those ways that one hopes to do that. And we've not been able to kind of learn on all of the areas that we'd hope to. Um, but Anders's point is really well taken. You know, there are places where they have been learning this stuff. The question is, will they be willing to share? And it's interesting you say that's quite a common question. I guess this must be in the film, in the farming world, a more common question than we have in public health. Um, well, it, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm speaking it, from the public health side of things. You know, we, <laughs> the golden rule is you don't look. <laughs> Because if you look, then you'll find, and then it's a public health issue. But on, you know, in public health worlds, you you can ask these questions because it's seen to be protecting health. But there's economies and things that play out on the the agricultural side. So not only on the AMR space, but just in general, you know. But Claire, if I I could comment just on the on the message you have in the chat also. I mean. We, we are working, for example, with, with the local government and ministries in, in Vietnam at the moment where, where they, they have clearly stated they would like to terminate the use of colistin in the pig production. And they're actually ready to make the legislation really to, uh, to enable that. Um, so, so actually with the industry, they're now setting up uh, different uh, trials and then some of them are simply, you know, colistin is mainly used for, for post-weaning diarrhea control um, within this three, four week space where after the piglets are weaned. And actually, and this is really E. coli associated diarrhea and you can easily use other uh, antimicrobials, uh, for example, just neomycin or other things. So there are different options for them, but they will just like to have some documentation in place uh, working with the industry that this is actually possible. Uh, also financially, economically, that will not harm the industry. And, and so, so they're ready to go into these trials. And, and, and this is something that uh, this new ICAS center is actually uh, supporting them with. So, yeah. Over. That's really great. It would be really interesting to learn how that works and um, what industry is when it's so many different actors. Fantastic. I'm sorry to say we've already exhausted an hour, uh, which seems to go um, quite quickly. Um, but I guess with such a massive topic like AMR combined with yet another massive topic like biosecurity and, and WASH, that's going to be um, how it goes. So um, everyone just to again reinforce that, that the findings have already been made available in that report. The link is available in the chat box. Um, and we will be posting the, the recording of the presentation um, on the HEAL website within the next week or so. Um, so thanks very much, Chris, for this very interesting presentation and the immense amount of work that you've uh, been able to complete. Um, good luck with the, uh, putting it all together in a short little piece for the, <laughs> for the literature. Um, and we look forward to everyone joining us again in another month's time we'll be making the announcements about the presentation uh, in a couple of weeks thank okay you. thanks very much thank you thanks to you all thanks for the invitation and and it's it's very very interesting and yes i hope this is useful for everyone thank you absolutely thanks so much thank you bye bye thank you bye